first of all, let's, uh, I want to thank all the sponsors today. Um, I actually, I work here at Turner, so I want to thank everybody that attended. Um, and hopefully you guys have enjoyed our campus so far. Uh, I think I've heard some good you know, comments around it, but I don't want to go into that too much. So what we're going to talk about today, uh, I'm going to talk about injection attacks and how to defend them if you're a software developer. Um, because for me, this is uh, important because I am a software developer here at Cerner. Um, so some quick information, I, I actually manage a group of a small team of people here, but I've been writing software for almost 10 years, uh, various different things, but in the last five years or so I've been doing uh, Rails and uh, Java services and applications. Uh, and I've got about a year of security experience. And when I say security experience, for me it's not um, typical security experience. It's, it's uh, we're creating tools to kind of measure some security uh, stuff here at Cerner. So it's not common uh, uh, penetration testing or other security things that, that some of you are probably familiar with. And so what that comes down to is that my <coughs> experiences so far uh, are all relatively new. So some of the stuff you're going to see today is uh, what I learned as a developer, just kind of getting some mild uh, introduction into, into some tooling. Um, so we have a quick, a quick agenda for you guys, just to kind of see what we're going to talk about. So we'll talk about what SQL injection is, just in case you guys aren't aware. It's going to be real brief, so if you are aware, you can just check out for the next three minutes and you'll be okay. Um, well, I'll show you some basic vulnerabilities, because that's really what it is as developers. Uh, we want to see what our code looks like that makes it vulnerable. And you'll be surprised at how easy that is in some cases. Uh, I'll show you how to do injection just manually by hand um, in a really cryptic fashion that's going to be really hard to ever find anything important. Uh, automated tools, which is what you're here for, you want to see the, the tools, right? And then uh, how we fix that vulnerability and then show rerunning that tool and then have some time for questions at the end. So let's get started with what it is. Here's the big wall of text that everybody loves to see. We don't have time to read that, so let's just go ahead and <laughs> bypass right by that. Here's what it really is, okay guys? So. We're going to append some SQL commands to the end of some input that uh, uh, this program is expecting for us. So if we're commonly saying, let's select user ID name uh, from a user's table where the name is Andy, um, what we're doing is we're just adding some extra to it. In this case, or one equals one. So this effectively turns this SQL command so that everything qualifies as true and we get everything every time. Does that make sense? Okay. So, um, there's an awesome slide on XKCD that also explains this, and you kind of have to put this in a talk if you want SQL injection, in my opinion, because it's really great. Uh, but effectively, they named their kid, um, uh, oh god, I can't even say it, Robert uh, apostrophe uh, parenthesis colon drop table students. And then the school called and says, hey, uh, we have a problem with your kid. And they say, oh, what do you do? And they say, well, you dropped all the tables in our database. They say, oh, little Bobby tables is what we call them, right? Because it's you know, every, every school he goes to, all the tables get dropped because they didn't sanitize their inputs. Um, so, so let's quickly uh, just cover why SQL injection matters. Every time we've had the OAuth top 10 list come out in 2010, 13, and 17, injection is the number one on the list. And it's, um, it's unfortunate it's the same time every time, but the list doesn't change very much, but this one's always at the top. So this is one of the biggest reasons why it matters. I found this awesome Hall of Shame website. Um, I'll post my slides later so you guys can go and see the URLs on LinkedIn. But this one just quickly shows a bunch of different um, attacks that have happened in the last, uh, this one, the screenshot shows last six months or so, and what they were. And you can see Equifax on this list. Uh, I think, no, I, I have to cut that one, I'm sorry. Equifax on this list is one of the places where they got everything exfiltrated from them too. But this website's cool because you can just see anybody that had SQL injection somewhere in their breach and uh, you can see how, how often this has actually happened in the world. Um, but why does this keep happening, right? Because it's been around for a long time. But there's a typically, and you heard this this morning if you were, I think, in the keynote, or one of the talks this morning, um, where you, you have a kickstarted campaign or something you're going to create, and it's an IoT device, and you put it out on the internet, and then you just shut down and you sell it off to somebody, and you had some VCs that came in and bought your product, and then you're done, right? In other corporate business, like a uh, big enterprises that have been around for a while, in some cases it's just a lack of focus uh, on security and development. It's not typically something that comes up in code reviews. I can probably count the number of times on, on my hands here how many times a SQL injection or other security things happen on a code review. And I've been doing this for a long time. I'm curious if, uh, you know, if there's anybody that disagrees with me that I'd love to hear from you come talk to me afterwards because this just isn't a thing that happens um, from what I've seen. And I would love to hear how to make that better uh, for everything I work on. 
So we have uh, all these guides on security. Everybody sees, you know, here's what I should be doing uh, in the Rails community. If I'm do, using Java, uh, Hibernate, or Juke, or other libraries, uh, there's a whole OAuth cheat sheet. I actually found it, I forgot to link this on here, Little Bobby Tables, if we go back to that reference. They have a website for Little Bobby Tables, and it's got um, 10 to 12, maybe 15 languages uh, for, for that uh, site that will go through and reference a bunch of different ways you can do injection for Python, uh, Java, Rail, like just enumerate the, the languages and go through them, right? So we have this bad practice where we read about the functionality and then we don't go read the rest of the, the API for how to do it securely, right? So me as a developer, I'm like, oh, it's done, ship it, right? Oh, I didn't do it how I should have probably done it because I didn't read all this stuff. And it's just our mindset that we want to get things done and quickly and, and get it out the door because that's what makes people happy when they get functionality. So. Uh, and we just, we have new people that join all the time and they just have a lack of awareness. Um, so, you, you, your responsibility as engineers is to try and teach each other and make ourselves better. So, so that's why it's been happening, uh, in my opinion anyways, for a while, based on some research I've done. So let's, let's quickly look at what, what code looks like that's vulnerable, okay? So, if anybody is familiar with, anybody written Ruby on Rails before? Do we have a lot of developers in here? I actually don't know how many developers in here. Okay, so that's a good number. So, if you're writing Ruby on Rails, this is a very, very basic uh, vulnerability. In here, I'm just writing a SQL statement, and this SQL statement, if you look at it, it's a select star from users, where ID equals to parameters, in this case it's a query parameter called ID, and we're just taking the direct user input, and we're just putting it right in the SQL statement. So this is a very, very exploitable uh, 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 query parameter, being ID, and the same thing for first name. I've created a small little database that's just a user's table, and for this example, and I'll uh, link you guys to all this uh, code later, uh, so you can see it all. So that's that. There's also uh, an interesting website I found called Rails S uh, SQLI, which is SQLinjection.org, which talks a bunch of different uh, things that you can expose uh, vulnerability-wise uh, from Rails. And this one I found kind of interesting because I didn't realize this, but some of uh, the methods I use somewhat more regularly, in this case calculate, uh, may not be one that I use, but there's others, um, and you run calculate and you can pass it an actual column, is the second parameter there, and that column itself is never sanitized by Rails. You have to do that on your own, calling other methods uh, to sanitize it before you do anything with it. And this is a pretty common practice in, in Rails. There's lots of methods that say, you know, select and you pass it direct SQL, or from and you pass it a table you want to, and none of those things are ever sanitized. You have to do that manually, which is not what I would expect from a, a DSL, in this case, Rails. The same thing holds true uh, in, if we look at Java. Do we have any Java developers here? Or, uh, yeah, okay, good. So if you write any Java code and you write web, uh, web services in Java, very, very same kind of vulnerability exists. If you look at this middle block, all we're doing is we're concatenating a big string with some, vulner, uh, with some vulnerable uh, query parameters in there, being ID, username, first name, last name. All of those are vulnerable in this code. And uh, if somebody passed those to us with something um, potentially malicious from an injection point, they would all come back as, as things that are bad. Okay, so we've seen a couple things that are injectable, and so you kind of know uh, what we can uh, inject. So if we go look at manual injection, so in this case, when I talk about manual injection, I'm not going to use any cool tools. I'm just going to use my knowledge of the API. In a lot of cases, if you're familiar with Swagger, um, Swagger is great because I can see everything that's available on an API. It's great for developers, it's great for people that are uh, coding against your APIs. It's really great for people that are trying to take uh, advantage of your API if it's vulnerable because they can see all your endpoints, all your query parameters, everything in just plain text on a screen. They can find it other ways, maybe too, but this way is really great for them. And then I'm going to use Postman. Postman, if you're not familiar with Postman, it just allows me to make requests to a web service uh, really straightforward and easy. So, the first uh, endpoint I'm going to do, and this is the, if you were to take my code down and run locally, um, you just hit localhost and then it's just user-based injection is the endpoint. And I've got a little recording to show. I record all my stuff up front, and all you can see is I hit that, and it just returns 100 users that I've seeded my database with. So, in this case, I got all my data back, and you can see this first guy, his name uh, was Armani Hand. Um, it was just all fake data, so it just got generated. So we go and hit this, and we get all that data back. So now if we want to get a single user, if you're not familiar with how you, know, you, you uh, add query parameters, and we've got, sorry, ID, first name, last name, and we can go get those uh, fields back, or get those people back based on that. And so in this case, I go get a single user back just by ID. In this case, ID is one. And then you got that guy back. And then we can do the same thing with uh, last name, or sorry, first name. And then we get the same guy back. And then we can go and hit 
<coughs> sorry, uh, last name and get the same guy back. And you can see that we're just uh, able to uh, hit us uh, a REST endpoint, a service endpoint, and get all this data back uh, for that single individual. So now what we want to do is this actual injection, right? So in this case, we're going to change up our, uh, uh, our query parameter. So instead of just passing ID equals one, I'm going to give it or and one equals one so that we do what we did earlier where we're saying give me everything uh, effectively if this, if this statement qualifies as true. So if we do this just via Postman again, and I change this last parameter, uh, sorry, I should have typed faster for demos, right? Like you'd think that would be quicker than me just doing live, but it's slow. Maybe it's slow for good reason. But you can see all we're doing is changing this parameter to or one equals one, and you can see now I've got all the data back. So we know immediately, as a developer, or as somebody that's looking at trying to attack your code, I can uh, inject on that parameter. I can go and test my other parameters too, in this case first name, because we know first name is also injectable, and you can also see all that data comes back by changing one, uh, one equals one. And then if we go change to last name, uh, in this case we made this parameter not injectable, so this just kind of shows you that if I add one, uh, or one equals one, uh, sorry, next slide. So in last name we had or one equals one, and then uh, if we add it to here, you can see I hit this uh, for his last name being one equals one, and then hit send, and then I don't get any data back in this case because it, uh, it disqualified the entire query. Uh, so, so that kind of shows you guys quickly how um, you can do that manually with just some um, real brute force ha uh, attempts at this. No one's ever going to get a significant amount of value out of doing this because most of the time they're not going to know immediately like the endpoints you're trying to hit and what you're trying to gather. But what they're going to do is use some automated tooling, right? So let's talk about the automated tooling. When I talk about this, uh, I'm, I'm talking about the hacker tools part of my talk description because that's why you guys are here. You want to see the hacker tools, right? There's a couple out there, but really, um, uh, as you look through these, the one that stands out to me is called SQL Map, and the reason for that is. Uh, it is as follows, but the biggest ones being that I can run it off of my console locally. It's also included with Metasploit, so if you use Metasploit regularly for what you're doing, it's already installed, so you can use it there. Um, it supports almost every major database language that I would use between MySQL, my, uh, SQL Server, uh, uh, Postgres, uh, but you can go look, the list goes on and on. You can enumerate all your users, so you can start extracting data out just based on uh, a, a, use, a set of users that are in the database. It uh, supports a handful of different techniques. So when you look at doing SQL injection, there's a handful of techniques, uh, Boolean-based blind, error-based, union uh, query-based, stack queries, and time-based blinds are all uh, uh, techniques supported by uh, this uh, tool. It's pretty feature-rich, so we'll get into what the features are here in a second, and you guys will see like how you can just absolutely take over some of these databases without uh, really even knowing that it's happened, and then um, just because this tool has so many features in it. And it's really well maintained. I think as of uh, when I was creating this slide the other day, uh, I think it had an update that was pushed into master in their GitHub repo three or four days ago. So they're constantly doing development on this thing. So this tool, as new things are coming out, is constantly being evolved. And this is just the open source tool that like people can use. It's not the stuff behind closed doors that somebody created on their own and they're working through on their own. And it's really well written. Uh, with tutorials and instructions. I, as a developer, had never used this tool until two months ago, and I was able to figure everything out that I would ever want to do with this tool almost immediately. So, us as developers, we're going to be under attack by things like this the second we write vulnerabilities and they're, they're available. So let's get hacking, okay? This is, this is what we want to do. So, we look at usage. Um, so the first thing we need to know, we need to know a target. So in this case, we know our target already because we uh, found it earlier. And in this case, it's ID and first name. Those two prayer parameters right there are the ones that are going to be the, the ones that are susceptible to, uh, to uh, getting uh, data out of there via SQL injection. Okay. So we're going to use the dash u command and the, the actual command is SQL map dash u, and then we're going to give it that entire query stream. And then there's other flags you can give it. In some of these cases, if I, if I use them, I'll talk about them. But verbosity is the one I'm going to use uh, primarily. And I use a verbosity level of four on everything I did here for this presentation. Um, but it goes one to five, and one being the default. And then there's a riskiness level. Riskiness, I was a little, um, I was tempted to try it out for this, but I didn't really. But 
And there's three levels of riskiness. Uh, one is the, the default, and you can get a bunch of data with one. Two and three is really where it looks like you, you can uh, start tampering with data and do some more things. I didn't investigate those too much for this talk, though. And then uh, you can actually, if you know the database already, you can target that database and make your queries uh, for injection a little bit faster because it doesn't have to figure out what your uh, database target is. And the list goes on and on. And I'll let you guys go read more if you want to know more about SQL map because they have, like I said, great usage documentation. So we want to look at this demo real quick. So if we're running that command I just sent you, uh, sorry, I should have prefaced this real quick. So on the left-hand side, uh, so I just have side-by-side -side two consoles. On the left-hand side, I've got uh, my application service uh, being vulnerable Rails is what I call this uh, service. Uh, it's just running um, in the console, and you're going to see all the logs from that um, just being piped out to the console. And on the right, you're going to see the, t the SQL map tool and all the commands I'm running. So you can see them side by side, and you can watch the logs as they spin by, and you can see really quickly like what's all happening behind the scenes as well as in the, the SQL map tool. So here I type SQL map, and I give it my URL with those query parameters, and I just copy and paste those in there. And then I think I gave it verbosity 4. Uh, yeah, so verbosity 4. And then I said uh, that other command is flush session because I'd been doing stuff in there earlier and I wanted to make sure it did uh, some other things. And then batch just says accept all the default um, uh, default prompts because I didn't care what any of the prompts were. And you can see that that's all you have to do. And then as soon as we run this, we're going to start getting output. In this case, our output. You can see on the right is just the spew of, of data, and it's not easy uh, immediately to understand what's going on here. You start scrolling up and you quickly find what it's doing is it's hitting your service with some payloads. So we can actually go over and look at our service, and we can see immediately in our access logs that it hit with that payload. And this payload is something that's, uh, that's causing it to be uh, having an injection against whatever that query parameter is testing. In this case, it was ID. And so if we scroll all the way down, <coughs> we can see uh, more logs. And you see here, it's actually said uh, this the get ID for our uh, get by ID parameter is actually injectable. So it identifies to you and tells you immediately what uh, what endpoints it found or what, sorry what what query parameter is injectable. And then we scroll all the way to the bottom. It tells you a breakdown of uh, where it thinks you should basically go next, and, and it keeps all this in memory. So when you come back uh, and you start using um, SQL map the next time around, you don't have to redo any of the work you've already done. It stores it all in the cache. That's what I was saying, I used flush session earlier, so it reset my cache. But, so what you can see here is, um, if you look at uh, get parameter ID, it tells you what type it used. In that case, it was uh, Boolean based blind, and then it tells you the payload it used. And then if you look down, it, it also found that you can do a union query, and um, it gave you the payload for that one. So, we know that now this, this is injectable. It also found out that my database, based on the, the commands that are running behind the scenes, and I think it run, uh, does it say on the screen how many it ran? Uh, sorry. Uh, it had 14 error codes, but uh, somewhere there, and I'm sorry I don't have that up there, it'll tell you how many different payloads it sent to, how many new URLs, and you can get that data uh, from there to see what it did. So this is awesome, right? Now we've got success, right? We can inject and run this against here and do some more things, more malicious things, because we identified an injectable parameter. So let's exfiltrate the data, because that's what we're in. We, uh, as, as the people hacking the system, want to get the data out, right? So we find all the databases. This is what we want to do first. Use this command dash dash dbs. It lists all the database. And uh, this is where we'll talk about prevention tips later, but this is all dependent on if the session user has read access. So we'll talk about uh, privilege, uh, least privilege. And so we just give it that command, dash dash dbs, along with the rest of it we did earlier. So if we do this now, same command as before, except we just do dash dash dbs. And you can see it prints out more stuff. It doesn't have to do all the same things it looked up earlier because it still has the same session. And you can see really quickly, it found two available databases, Information Schema and Security B. In this case, I know um, I'm going to go and attack Security B. That's the, that's the database I created for this uh, specific presentation. But Information Schema, it doesn't sound very important to me. But what does sound important to me is Security B. So if we go out here, we want to display all the tables in this database. You can give it dash dash tables. And then you can go um, and you give it your database and dash dash tables. And then from here, <coughs> You, uh, so you'll see down here on the right. Sorry, 
sorry if that is in the way. Uh, so dash dash or dash secure ID or security B in the dash dash tables, and it'll print all, all the tables I, I care about. So me as a Rails developer, I know uh, I don't care about AR internal metadata, and I don't care about schema migrations. Those aren't important to me. What I care about is users, right? We, we as people that are trying to defend things, we uh, or sorry, uh, people that are trying to attack things, they're looking for user information. What kind of information can we get out of there? So we want to display all the columns because we want to know what data we can get out. So dash dash columns, surprisingly enough, this API reads really easy. It's uh, simple to work with. List all the tables for the column. In this case, I just want to see what they are. So dash dash columns on the users table, which is dash t. Oops, sorry. So we uh, print all this. Uh, so we're going to change our query or change our statement around. And then here, now you can see I print that out all the columns on this table. And so on this table, um, we're looking at some stuff. First, you're going to find the, the idiot engineer that did this. He wrote phone number wrong, which is me. I had a typo. So um, you can see that real quickly. But what we also see is we've got usernames and passwords. They store this stuff right on their table. And more commonly than not, uh, this is how thing, this is how easy databases are being, or how simply databases are being created. Uh, and, and all these companies are being breached. We're finding passwords in plain text on tables just like this. So the first thing you want to look at is maybe having a different model for having uh, a password uh, storage mechanism. So if we continue along here, we're going to dump this data now because that's what we really want. The, the, the people that are doing the hacking, this is what they're trying to get, is this data dump. So it's dash dash dump. You can actually uh, just print it to a console. You can uh, print it to a CSV, all kinds of different things you can get it from. So. And just again, continuing our, uh, appending on our, our, our statement there, it's just dash dash dump. So if we dump this out, so here we give it uh, the columns that I want to give it, or I want to display, so name and password, because are the only ones I care about in this case. Uh, I should have been using it, but it's name. And you can see really quickly, here's all the data from that database. And that's how easy it is just by me as a developer making one small mistake in my uh, development code. Yeah, Caleb. Not a developer. Where should that be stored? Should where it be should password information? How and where should you store that otherwise? Um, so that's a good question. I don't know the right answer to that question. Okay. I, I just don't think that uh, unencrypted information. Right. So it should be encrypted somewhere. I just don't have the right answer for that. So okay. if you actually want to attend um, Matt Randall's giving a talk here shortly about, hey, yeah, there he's in the back, actually. Hey, hey there. What's up, Matt Randall? Well, he's already got a yeah, mic. You don't actually uh, encrypt passwords. You actually just want to hash and salt them. And yeah. uh, particularly algorithms called S-crypt and B-crypt. There we go. do an iterative hash algorithm over them in order to make it computationally expensive. Yeah. Um, just go online and look up the B-crypt yeah. and how to salt and hash passwords. Uh, you probably find that. And then where you physically store them is, is probably doesn't really matter much whether it's a database or other yeah. system just as long as you lock it down. Yeah. So, um, but then given enough, you know, as long as you're doing that, then you're making some good attempts at things. So thanks, Matt, for that. Uh, what you'll run into still, though, is they have your data. And so if they've reused this anywhere else, right, then they can go and try and figure out things based on reuse everywhere. So, so this is awesome, right? This is the data that people are looking for uh, when they're trying to hack into our systems. <laughs> and so, so we want to fix these things and we want to prevent them, right? And, and you know what's really funny about this is it's actually really easy. And it just gets commonly over, overlooked. So in Rails, they have a whole API that's well defined. In this case, we just, uh, it's called, um, uh, it's just called passing around uh, the hash values explicitly. In this case, it's just using where and saying ID and giving your frame ID. So it's really easy. It's actually not, like I said, not very hard at all. Java, same way. In this case, we're using prepared statements. And, and here, it's just a matter of giving it a, a set of uh, um, uh, uh, question marks. And then below, we just set those strings. Now, these are all going to be dependent on what library you're using. Obviously, you're using Juke or Hibernate or, or any you know, different library. You need to go read and see exactly how to use prepared statements. But if we rerun SQL map now that we've changed that, what we're going to see, uh, I, I changed the API to users fixed basic injection just so you can see this. And if I rerun this thing, uh, and go ahead and go, and you can see it's going to run and do all the same things we did before, except now, at the very end, it says, I couldn't find anything that was injectable based on what I know today. And so that, as developers, that's what we want to see. So as developers, 
use this tool and run it against your data or run it against your services and your application to go test some things. So let's look at some action items or takeaways from today. So first of all, understand the security concerns of your technology you're using or you're developing in. If you don't read the API, if you don't read the security documentation for it, the APIs you're, or the, the, the APIs you're working with, you're going to have vulnerabilities somewhere. And always use language-specific prepared statements. So I showed those in Java. It's, they're not called prepared statements in Rails, but they're very similar. Um, and never, never trust user input. Uh, in doing that, no matter what it is, you're going to run into some problems because users are going to be malicious somewhere down the road and they're going to give you some bad input. Participate in code reviews as developers. This is uh, probably the number one problem I have just with development in general. Most people don't spend enough time on code reviews and just looking at code and understanding what it does and making sure we understand you know, what kinds of things we should be looking at. And so me as a developer, this is one of the things I try and focus on and I harp on my team to do the same thing. And then we talked about privilege of least, or sorry, principle of least privilege a little bit ago. If we had just locked down our user from a developer perspective to not being able to see all those other things, there's potential that they wouldn't have been able to uh, move around and look at other databases. In this case, it was just a single database uh, with a single table in it. But if we had you know, everything stored in that single MySQL instance, we could have gone and looked at everything at that point. And so by locking down the users that, are, that have access to that, those individual things, we can lock that down really quickly. So, um, so now I'm going to take some time for questions real quick. Uh, we've got like two or three minutes going on. Um, Caleb already asked a question, so he's ruled out. But if anyone has questions, um, I'm more than happy to answer questions. So you can grab me afterwards. Yeah. Do you have any third party tools all the um, so he asked the question if there are any third-party services or tools that you can hire to do this for you. Um, what I would do look is hiring a penetration tester to do. Not, they're going to do way more than this, but they're going to be the guys that are going to have the experience. So depth security, I don't know if anybody from depth security is in here right now. In the back, those guys do penetration testing, and they regularly you know, take down applications, and they, and they um, export your data out there. But I would go talk to them, or there's other companies here doing uh, today that we talk to as well. So. There's a lot of tools for uh, what is called dynamic scanning, which is yeah. basically trying to black box it from the outside and uh, do all of those testing. And also a static analysis, which is running the code. Sure. So tons of windows out there, tons of tools out there. Yeah. Um, totally, I mean, scan almost everything we do. Yeah. Any other questions? So uh, if you have any questions after this, you can reach me on Twitter, which is anelson425. And then if you want to see this code, uh, I probably have a few things I haven't committed and pushed out there, but you can find it. This is my uh, GitHub repo. You can go see it right there. It's real, again, it's a pretty trivial um, place. It's all set up with Docker Compose, so you don't actually have to have Ruby or Rails or anything installed locally. If you have Docker on your machine, you can get it up and running within a couple minutes. And I have, uh, this is where I said, I don't know if the readme is quite up to date, but you're just, I'll get it up to date and I'll get it pushed. Um, and then if you have any feedback, uh, here's your uh, QR codes for feedback. Uh, I appreciate your feedback uh, that you want to provide me or the conference appreciates as well. So thank you.